two science panels uh, today are to really give us all a sense of the state of the knowledge on forests and other sustainable development objectives. Um, you know, when I was in elementary school back in the 70s, uh, at least in the United States, there were these bumper stickers that said, if you want peace, work for justice. And I always thought that in forests, we ought to have bumper stickers that were along the lines of, if you care about water, work for forests. Or if you care about rural livelihoods, work for forests. And I think it's those kinds of slogans that we want to fill out uh, today from our, our distinguished panel to learn about, you know, what do we know about the relationship between forests and food, between forests and energy, and forests and income. Um, you may have seen as you come, came in that C4 has put together these handy little fact sheets, you know, sort of one page summary of what you might want to know about the relationship between forests and biofuels, for example. So if you didn't pick them up on your way in, I'd encourage you to do so. And you can certainly refer to these in the discussion if you want to contest some of the propositions that were in these, these fact sheets or use them as a point of departure uh, for discussion. Let me just get a sense of the interest that's in the room. I'm going to ask you to have to choose, if you had to choose one among the food, energy, or income, what would be your primary interest? So raise your hand if you're here for the forest and food discussion. You're about forest and food security. Okay, pretty good team going for the, the food thing. How about forests and energy? How many of you are here concerned about the biofuel thing or the wood fuel thing? Okay, well, pretty even balance. Anybody specifically here for the income thing? Forest and really good. Well, boy, but some of you voted twice, I'll tell you. Okay, uh, but that's good because we all understand these things are, are very much interrelated. Well, that's great. I think we have a, um, a good sense of, of broad-based interest to, across the, the audience. And we know that you had a choice of coming to this one or the one over there on climate and water, but uh, we're quite confident that you chose well because we have a, a very gr a great panel, diverse panel, knowledgeable panel here to, to lead off our discussion this afternoon. Um, let me start out with a brief round of introductions. And I'll just go in the order of uh, where, how my colleagues have seated themselves. Um, to my immediate left is Bariki Ka'ale. Bariki is the, <laughs> smile and wave, Bariki, okay. Bariki is currently the chairperson of the Tanzania Specialist Organization on Community Forestry and Biodiversity Conservation. So he's got a lot of experience on the doing side of, of uh, community forestry. But he's also an expert on forests and energy. And in fact, has served as UNDP's Energy and Environment Specialist in Tanzania and also for more than 10 years, I think, has been the regional technical advisor on energy and forestry for the Southern African Development Community, so SADAC. So we're, we're very pleased to have Bariki here with us today. Um, immediately to his left is Hanata Morson Teixeira de Andrade. Close enough? Okay. Um, Renata, uh, a native of here in, in Brazil, is a professor of environmental planning and management of the Catholic University of Brasilia. And Renata is an expert on biofuels, bioenergy, and has been working both with C4 and ECRAF related uh, projects on bioenergy here in Brazil, and has also been collaborating with the Energy Biosciences Institute at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, to Renata's left is Ruth DeFries. Ruth is, a, and this is very appropriate for Rio Plus 20, 20 years ago we probably didn't have professors of sustainable development. But Ruth DeFries is the Denning Professor of Sustainable Development at Columbia University in New York City. And flew in just this morning from Bonito, Brazil, where the Association for the Society of, um, sorry, ATBC. Association for the Tropical Biology and Conservation is meeting. So she stepped out of that meeting to be here with us today. Um, Ruth is uh, a person who examines land use change over broad scales from the bird's eye view, using particularly satellite uh, imagery analysis, and has um, really influenced the debate about the relationship between food production and forest cover. And so we're, we're very happy to have her with us today. She's also one of those people who won one of those MacArthur Foundation Genius Awards. So uh, we have at least one genius among us uh, today. Um, last but not least, on the far end, uh, we have with us Freddie Kwesiga. Freddie is currently the African Development Bank's representative in Zambia. 
but he has also had a distinguished career, including with the CGIR, and did a stint with ICRAF uh, as the um, principal scientist and regional coordinator for ICRAF's programs in Southern Africa. He was also the coordinator of the CGIR's Sub-Saharan Africa Challenge Program. Um, and it's, it's said it's got in his back pocket a CGIR-related announcement for later this afternoon, so we'll, we'll wait to see what that is. So the program that we're going to follow today, um, with your uh, cooperation, is that I will take the liberty of starting out and hand each panelist a couple of questions to get them started, give them a chance to characterize what they think you need to know about the state of knowledge about forests and food, energy, income. Uh, but then we'll save at least a half an hour of the session to open it up for your uh, questions and comments and really have a chance to ask the expert you know, on, on some of these issues. And then at 3.30, we'll break for coffee before continuing on to the, the policy implications part of our agenda. Sound good? OK, so I'm going to do my questions from down here. So Renata. We're going to start with you. Um, we're here in Brazil, and we know that Brazil is sort of one of the, 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 the success stories on, on bioenergy with the sugarcane-based ethanol. And so we want, to, we want to hear about that success story and what implications there may or may not be for forests. But we also want to press you a bit on, on what uh, some of the concerns may be and what's the science behind the concerns about bioenergy development more broadly. I know that C4 research has suggested that there may be some social and environmental implications um, related to converting forests to bioenergy fuel crops. And we want to learn lessons from the Brazilian experience, um, not only relevant here, but also in, in other parts of the world. So maybe you can start off by characterizing for us your research about bioenergy development here in Brazil, both currently, social and environmental implications, and maybe looking ahead to the future a bit. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, can you hear me down there in the back? OK. Um, well, first of all, um, I'm currently I've been coordinator of a group called Google We are looking into uh, governance issues regarding to biofuels expansion as well as climate change. So we're looking at the future as well, you know, historically as well as the future, uh, what the implications are in the energy sector being expanding, especially in the Cerrado region, the savannas in Brazil, as well as in the Amazon. And we know historically that sugarcane is the oldest industry of ethanol in Brazil, you know, since the 1970s. So we start out looking into that, um, and we look at very uh, specifically labor violations in the sugarcane frontiers, because the sugarcane is being spent in Brazil to know how uh, everyone familiar with that, and especially in the Northeast and then in Sao Paulo State. But then the, the, as we have been um, put into place a very strong policy for commoditization of the ethanol, there's a, a huge input of investments since like, uh, 2007, and then the expansion from 2005, in fact, in all words, 2000, during especially President Lula, um, with the agri-energy plan, that suddenly the expansion happens in regions that were never really uh, sugarcane before, such as you know Goiás state and the, the, the quantity and amount of sugarcane farms and ethanol distillers that never seen. So this expansion is being looked at by INPE, the national agency, to just make sure that. Uh, they're not entering into the Amazon. So there's this very beautiful agriculture zoning areas, but we are looking at the expansions and, and also thinking, well, what sort of like labor relations are gonna happen there? And there's a lot of labor violation happening because uh, there's another law as well um, limiting the emissions from sugarcane um, planters, and when they harvest, they have to burn. Um, and normally used to burn. And now they're not burning anymore because they have to mechanize because of this um, phasing out, uh, burning phasing out law. As we have to diminish the amount of uh, CO2 emissions from the harvesting process because of, of course, climate change, uh, suddenly mechanization made an incredible uh, amount of sugarcane uh, production that the planters uh, and the harvesters have to 
continue falling. So the harvesters on manual harvest had to work overload. So that was one of the research, part of our research is to understand this labor relations. And we saw there's an increasing amount of work done by the government and policies to stop the slave labor in the industry because it was pretty much making the industry look very bad in, in the outside uh, world for exports especially. Um, the other side of, the, uh, of our research is looking at, of course, how sugarcane expanding in the Cerrado region are the forcing or creating a direct land use impact or indirect land use impact. And we're looking at by uh, seeing the municipality that be increasing the amount of sugarcane planting and how that be displacing other planting, other crops, in fact, like soybeans and displacing corn, displacing uh, ranching and how that be happening and there's sort of dynamics to understand in Cerrado how what what is happening what we've seen so far in our direct you know measurements is that there is yes some change in the land direct changes some deforestation happening some changes in, in land concentration and changes as well in the way that sugarcane is creating like a dynamic economic dynamic in the region that's never before happened um, and other side of our research is in the Amazon, and of course the soy moratorium, as everyone or some of you know, um, put some limits in the way soybean would expand in Brazil as one of the crops for production of biodiesel. It's another sort of like you know, important fuel, and the biodiesel production in Brazil depends on mainly on soybean. And because the moratorium soy could not go into the Amazon region, has to float around uh, the Cerrado region that was put as a very important new agriculture frontier. So we expanded in regions that have never been before, such as in the region of South Bahia, no, I'm sorry, not South Bahia, but Central West Bahia, and the Abajeras, and as well going to Tocantins, POE, regions that were never, never had soy. So we've seen that already happening and also the first station coming up and some land concentration from that. And so smallholders um, have to uh, really take a big, big, strong uh, policy in order for them to continue existing. And especially because for biodiesel production, we depend on the smallholders. And one more for the Amazon region, uh, we look into the oil palm expansion. It's a new frontier, especially in Pará State, with the new set of policies that are all setting in place now in Brazil since 2010 for the National Sustainable um, Oil Pump Program. And we are looking at the effects in the local uh, arrangements and how, uh, for example, uh, in the Moju or Tomé Sur region of these municipalities, the smallholders are fighting against expansion of monocrops like that, like the ones from oil palm. And we are understanding the local governance that put forces in, against and forward this expansion, especially because we have large uh, companies, oil companies like Petrobras buying Agropalma and Bio Valley being bought by, I'm oh, sorry, Bio, Bio Valley, this is from the Valley mining, buying Bio Palma. So that's like huge players, as well as ADM, entering the region and change the landscape and as well the relationship with smallholders. Okay, so it sounds like we have some evidence of direct and impact, uh, direct and indirect impacts on deforestation through this land use change with the exactly. three different biofuel feedstocks, and also some concerns about concentration of land or maybe adverse impacts on smallholders. Exactly. Later this afternoon, we'll be we'll be talking to to policymakers and think about the policy implications. What tools has Brazil started to use that maybe help mitigate these negative environmental or, or social impacts? Or what international tools or commodity roundtables or in renewable energy standards or, or what do you think is the most promising way forward to manage those impacts? Well, we have the some policies taking place is like to protect some parts of the forests, like the, um, in the agro-energy agro plan, we have the agro-zoning regions, so that are agroecological zoning for sugarcane, for example, the ones that really uh, impeding and stopping the expansion of sugarcane in, in the Amazon region. However, uh, the, the Cerrado has nothing to be protected of because the forest code even uh, give a warranty that we can still deforest another 
up to 80% of the forest that is remaining. So there's nothing to protect what we have now as the biome. It's the second large biome. Um, for small holders, we do have uh, with the biodiesel um, some protection in terms of contracts that has to do with the social step, food step, that is taking place and apply the companies, the biodiesel companies, to buy some of the crops from in certain amounts to be able to get tax exemptions uh, from small holders. And that means that they need to give uh, some protection to the small holders in terms of price and, and income. But some risks are involved in that too, or also technical assistance. But some risks are involved because some of those uh, small holders, for example, they have diversified um, crops. And they, they have to wipe up everything in plant. For example, Jatropha and Tocantins. We didn't talk about Jatropha, but also we have in our group, we could study Jatropha and castor oil, bean. And they are uh, going through deep problems because they can't really continue. There's no sustainability. So some issues about sustainability and returns, there are the investments have been an issue for them. So they stopped producing some regions. So biodiesel created some deforestation. Um, and it's slightly deforestation in some regions where there's cutting them, but not so much. But the problem is that people are already planting their castor oil really sell the oil for biodiesel. They're buying from soybeans. There's other issues about the market. So, you know, we, we have to protect the small holders in other ways. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think we've got a, the first introduction to some of the complexities of biofuel uh, development and relationships to, to forests and, and rural livelihoods. I want to change continents and change fuels and um, ask Bariki to give us a, a brief tutorial on what we know about the state of play on fuel wood and charcoal as an important source of energy for both rural communities and urban communities in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, back in uh, December in Durban, C4 and various partners put on a one-day symposium on dry forest issues. And among the sessions there were discussions about the state of the knowledge of the resilience of African forests, um, the dry forests in particular, um, to this, you know, heavy and perhaps increasing pressure you know, for wood fuels. And we were told, to my surprise, that the, the information base is actually a bit patchy in terms of you know, what the sustainable um, pressure might be or, or what to do about it. So I'm interested in, in your views about what, what do we know about the uh, extraction of wood fuel and charcoal um, in sub-Saharan Africa and the resilience of the forest to that pressure to be able to maintain other services but also uh, provide energy for those societies. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think you need energy for two specific reasons. One, you need energy for surviving. This is energy which you need to cook your food every day. You need energy for night in your house. Secondly, you need energy for development. As you are here in this building, you need to have electricity or the reliable energy we are in trouble. But God gave us different sources of energy. We have got different sources of energy. Depends how much we can use the resources to sustain our effort. And each energy source has got its own implication in terms of finance, technology, etc. When you come to Africa, we've got a lot of energy resources. But this energy resource to be available, it should be affordable to the majority of the people. It should be sustainable and reliable to use. So in Africa, they are valuable data. When we come for energy for cooking, almost 90% of the total energy used in most parts of the Africa, if you take out uh, Northern, Northern Africa and a bit of South Africa, is mainly biomass fuel. The biomass fuel are used in two. In the rural areas, we are mainly using direct firewood. In urban areas, we are mainly using charcoal, because charcoal is more convenient to use in urban areas. But this wood fuel is collected in normal cases. It is collected from communal woodlands. And people collect it free. In that case, people are not collecting that. But however, population has been increasing. And population of communal forests has never been uh, sustainably managed. As a result, there has been a, a continuous degradation of the forest. 
If I give you some specific examples which I can show you, for example, in Tanzania, in 1961, we had 44 million hectares of forest with a population of 7 million people. So if we divide the forest in relation to the people, each person in Tanzania had almost 6.3 hectares of forest to survive. So you could collect firewood easily and the charcoal was no problem. But now, Tanzania, we have 44, 45 million people with a forest area of 33 million hectares. And in reality, the 33 million hectares, it is mainly on paper because most of the forests have been completely destroyed. They don't have trees, they are grass dead, but we call them forests because they are gazetted, they are known as forests preserved, but the trees have gone. So, if you now check the area per capita in Tanzania, you have declined from 6.3 to now 0 0.6 over hectare. But our energy consumption have remained the same. We are mainly using biomass for cooking. Then you say, why can't you use modern energy? Why don't you move to electricity? So for the past 50 years, in Tanzania and in many other southern countries, we have concentrated to find ways of providing modern energy to the people, particular electricity, LPG, and so forth. But current results, you have checked, for example, in Tanzania, when the five-year development study wanted to reduce consumption of energy or biomass from 90 to 80. After five years, when we made the research, we found that the population relying on biomass increased from 90 to 99 and did not decline. And the number of poor people increased by almost 2 million. Can you try to find what are the factors? You find here some of the factors is lack of energy. So the people themselves have realized that energy is getting scarce, and resources are getting scarce, so they have to find ways of doing it. So people, we have tried what we say, we call participatory forest management. We are trying people that they, they should participate in conserving the forest together. And in participatory forest management, we've got two systems. We've got where people are planting trees within their farmland, which is the most uh, active people can plant trees in your area, which is easy and required and then you use the systems. And we've got where people are planting trees on communal land, mainly on hills, top, hilltops and so forth. But they don't target mainly firewood, but they're trying to target mainly conservation of water areas, but also at the end they get a bit of firewood. But also we will try to initiate new forest management. But as I said earlier, because conservation of firewood have been in, it is in the informal sector, the, the government have not much collected that. But recent data shows that if the current situation will continue, for example in Tanzania and in many other African countries, we are not going to succeed. There is a very clear picture that if majority of people are not able to afford alternative energy, then we have to assist them to get the energy they need for surviving. Now we are putting a lot of emphasis on energy for development which in Tanzania accounts for less about 80% of the total energy use. And you are forgetting 92%. You cannot forget that. So in that case, really, why, why we like that is that because the informal sector has not been very much emphasized, but we hope now it is high, it's high time we see that we have to integrate development of energy for survival as well energy for development, which is very important for us. Thank you. Tell us a bit more about, um, I mean, I remember when I was in uh, college or graduate school, this is back in the 70s and 80s, when there was a big focus on concern about deforestation in sub-Saharan Africa and, you know, the uh, wood fuel crisis even then, you know, a generation ago, and a huge emphasis on planting wood lots and in introducing improved cook stoves and all kinds of things. I mean, what have we learned over the last 30 years about what works or what are the barriers to those kinds of interventions to, in order to be able to solve the problem that you've just outlined to us? What, are, what would be the, the top lesson learned? Thank you very much. I think from 1970s, FAO, World Bank, and so forth, we did emphasize a lot that there was a full wood crisis and there was a need to take action. So some of the challenges or some of the ways of solving the issue was to establish wood loss. Wood loss is a small plantation. 
plant a weed, for instance, we know we plant trees on the uh, straight roads, uh, two meters by two meters, and so forth, and we use many exotic species and so forth. So some villagers have established wood laws and they work a bit, but the, we are mainly emphasizing planting wood laws for firewood. But later we find that the people are actually totally looking for firewood, and as a matter of fact, the wood lot could provide multiple products. It could provide the firewood, it could provide the poles which they are selling, they could provide the fruits, they could provide the fodder and so forth and contribute. So we have to intensify that one. Another way was to establish industrial firewood plantations. I think in Brazil they are leading industrial firewood plantations where they put over almost 500,000 hectares. But the, for to meet household energy demand, in Africa, very few countries, Ethiopia is the one leading you trying to establish that one, uh, Bito, Uganda, uh, Mauritius. But here, this industrial firewood plantation, we find that first of all, they are very far from the, the where the people need the, the trees. The people are far from our, and then we use mainly uh, exotic species, so we monoculture type of system, and they didn't prove very well. I remember we had an industrial plantation in Malawi, that they have the plantation. <coughs> We conducted the study and we found oh, we have reduced by diversity. Secondly, the minimum increment was only about 15 cubic meters per hectare per year, while in the area which we cleared, they would get more wood than what is there. It was not very effective for water catchment in the initial years. And people were not able to pay for the wood. People were mainly looking for free wood. They used to get free wood, but yeah, they no, it's not, it's not free, they have to pay. So we find that uh, if you are putting industrial plantation, there's industrial plantation for specific demand, like uh, what they have put here in Brazil, where it is meeting the steel industry, it is meeting the factory industry, it is good. Some other areas we are having industrial plantation for, for generation of power. In Tanzania, we have some industrial plantation now which are used for generation of electricity, and they are very effective. And we find that actually it is paid more to have this industrial plantation for generation of electricity and even to grow for wood. But then you have got the individual tree planting. It's where I think each person can plant a tree, and you can own the tree, you can help them by the children. This one is acting very well. The only thing what is a bit lacking is technical expertise on the appropriate tree species you can grow, and what can you get out of it? What is the market, the integration? I think here where we experts we need to provide some more assistance. Which are the most appropriate tree species? Because the tree species are changing year after year. Which ones are the most appropriate? How do you get the best seed? Because planting tree depends very much on the seed. If you plant a poor seed, you get a poor crop. But the farmers are just planting from very poor seeds and then they don't get the proper crop, they say this is very bad. But it's good to lack of this. But I think it is it's where we have got a lot of opportunities and it depends from site to site. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So we've got uh, technological issues, choice of the right species and right seeds and that kind of thing, tenure issues, who gets to own the tree, um, but also market access issues. So a lot of problems to solve simultaneously. So those of you who raised your hands as being particularly interested in the forest and energy questions, you've had two speakers talking uh, about the biofuels and about the, the fuel wood charcoal issues. And if you have questions or comments, hold them, because we'll, we'll come back around to this some after we hear from our other speakers. I want to turn now to Ruth DeFries, who has been really credited with making breakthroughs about how we analyze um, land use change and land cover change using, again, satellite imagery analysis and understanding what's driving those changes and what some of their, their environmental implications might be. Let me just give you a chance, Ruth, to describe to us you know, what your research is showing, what you're learning, you know, what might be a bit surprising, some of the challenges. Thank you, Francis. Uh, thank you for that generous comment. I need to correct you, though. There's a, a, a fairly large community of people who are using uh, satellite data to look at uh, changes in forest cover. And a, a premier example of that is in this country, in Brazil, where there has been um, very sophisticated forest monitoring in place for decades. And it has been extremely instrumental in, um, in being one of the factors which has has led to a very dramatic decline in deforestation over the last few years. So there are many people uh, working on that. Uh, in terms of how we're seeing the pressures on forests changing, I think we've seen a real shift in the last decade or so from the pressure on forests shifting from 
clearing for small scale agriculture, for subsistence, for local farmers, for small clearing, to more and more pressures coming from the um, commercial agricultural sector, uh, from large scale clearing, uh, for uh, commodities, and this is very much driven by the uh, increase in agricultural exports and increase in the number of people who are living in cities and putting demands for food production that's produced in places uh, far, far from where they live. And th this urbanization trend is one of the defining trends of the century that we live in. So we can only expect that these sorts of commercial pressures uh, will be more and more on, uh, on forests for, as the last frontier for agricultural expansion. And that's both a challenge and an opportunity challenge is that the, uh, the, the commodity production for soy, for oil palm, for these, um, these products uh, is very high value and the demand will increase more and more, so the value will uh, increase. So it's very difficult to counter that, um, that high value, but the opportunity is there also. And the opportunity is that, uh, that this type of pressure on forests for, for clearing, for commercial production, can respond to market incentives, can respond to, as was mentioned here, uh, uh, soy moratoriums and such kinds of um, such kinds of signals coming from uh, from the market for these uh, these commodities, and those incentives can be used uh, to promote an, an efficiency of the way that we think about using land. For example, again in, in this country there is lots and lots of cleared land that can be used more intensively and more efficiently for agricultural um, production and instead of clearing more forests, those lands can be used uh, instead of um, instead of having to clear uh, clear more. And again, we saw that trend in the last in the last few years here in Brazil, and that's one of the factors again that contributed to the decline in, uh, in deforestation. So with this shift from pressures on forests, from small scale uh, landholders to large scale commercial production, there are challenges and opportunities, and it will be nice if we can figure out how to focus on the, uh, the opportunities to be able to both meet, uh, meet needs for food production and forests at the same time. Let me ask you to say a little bit more about the, the forests and food security um, dynamic. Uh, yesterday, several of us were at this Agriculture and Rural Development Day, and there was a session on land sparing versus land sharing you know, approaches and the degree to which agricultural intensification would be necessary or sufficient uh, to protect forests. And of course, you know, I was there talking about the many ways that you know forests contribute to food security, so we really can't see it as a as a trade-off. Like we have to sacrifice forests for food security. But you've done research and published on this too. So could you tell us a little bit more about how to think about the forest food security dynamic? Well, clearly, uh, forests are uh, uh, extremely important for uh, for those people who depend on forests for their livelihood, for their energy, for wild foods, uh, medicinal plants, and so on. And that's about one billion. In the world, so that's extremely um, important. But that's not all. Uh, that's not the end of the story. In why forests are important for food production, all of humanity depends on forests for uh, for food production in terms of the services that forests provide. In terms of the carbon storage, which, which regulates the climate. In terms of maintaining the hydrologic cycle to have um, water uh, for agricultural production in terms of uh, forests as stores for wild relatives of, uh, of plant species, which are so important for, uh, for plant breeding, for um, plants which can be more drought tolerant or pest tolerant, based on the challenges that are coming, that are here with, uh, with climate change, in terms of disease regulations. These services that forests provide for us that go beyond the, the very important uh, service for the one billion people who depend directly on forests for their livelihoods to all of us who depend on forests uh, indirectly in distal ways for the services that forests provide. Okay, thank you. 
So, last but not least, we have Freddie Quesiga. Um, Freddie has tipped me off that he had a little announcement he wanted to make before I was allowed to interrogate him. Um, so, Freddie, you, you got a minute to, to tell us what, what it is that you want to share with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Thank you very much, audience. Thank you very much, C4. I have good news and bad news from Africa. But I'll start with the good news. The first good news is that Africa believes like C4 in sustainable government and most of forests. And our own tagline at the African Government Bank is that we build today a better Africa tomorrow. So that's the way we find sustainability. Number two, the African Government Bank has just invested $100 million in the CGIR, which our president announced just a month ago. And number three, we have also invested $350 million to tackle the resilience in the Sahel and also in the Horn of Africa. These are important areas for institutions like C4 and the CGIR to make sure that you take advantage of this African institution which believes in knowledge, knowledge sharing, but also knowledge which makes a difference at the small scale farmer level. The knowledge we generate is huge volumes, but this knowledge must have impact on the local person so that the forests we're talking about are very, very important for us. This is a message number one. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take that message and turn it right back into a question for you. Um, as you may know, C4 has been doing a, a research project over the last several years called the Poverty and Environment Network, where we've mobilized, I think it's 36 graduate students to do dissertations on the degree to which rural households in and around forests get income from the forests. And now that the 8,000 some households worth of data um, has been given a preliminary analysis, the magic number is that on average these households get about 24 percent of their income from forests which is an extraordinarily large number when you think that it's even higher than the income that they get from on average from agricultural crops very significant um, in its own right but also significant because we can be pretty sure that that statistic doesn't make it into national accounts and so that income from the forest that is so important to rural livelihoods um, is not visible to national level policymakers. So you work at the African Development Bank. You know how these economic policymakers work. You know how national policymakers think and economists. If we know that, say, even you know from the dry forests where these these uh, forest-based income sources are particularly important and particularly invisible, now that we know you know how important they are, how do we? get them into strategies to uh, meet the Millennium Development Goals to address rural poverty, but also protect the environment at the same time. Africa has seen a future which is not the same as it used to be. What do I mean? Uh, my colleague talked about Africa 50 years ago when we gained independence. Our first priority was to fight disease, poverty, ignorance. And we've been doing that at the African Development Bank. Our main goal is to fight poverty, eradication, and also socioeconomic development. But we've forgotten the challenges that are ahead. The challenges ahead include environmental degradation and climate change. In our own work, we've seen that the forests which we're dealing with, particularly covering the largest part of Africa, are the dry forests. Yes, we're putting a lot of money in the Congo forest, working with people and others. There's $100 million to support the Congo forest. But the dry forest of Africa, including the Savannah, the Biombo, and the Sahel, is where most of the resilience was supposed and was in the past. The empires you hear about, Kanem Bono, they thrive because there are forests there. Now, our people have probably taken on a different turn. Population has increased and surged. People have moved away from rural areas to urban areas. We are being fed by the old and frail. And the feeding part that sustains our livelihoods are forests. Forests, for example, she talked about medicinal plants. How much do we know of the medicinal plants in the dry forests? The carrying capacity of these forests is very low. 
We have over 50 known indigenous fruit trees. They are descending Tata, all these important fruit trees. Like you have here, Rambutan, or you have uh, others in Southeast Asia. Ours have not been touched by science. When are we going to get a kiwi from the African woodlands in the Miomba and savannas? We have a lot of gum Arabic. There is a lot of science, but we don't know even the DNA of these plants. Therefore, if C4, everybody here in, involved in, say, in the forest uh, as a sustainability part of it, let us look at one, how do we get more out of the indigenous uh, uh, fruit trees that we have? How do we get much more from the medicinal plants and pattern them? How do we move away from silver bullet of taking one species and not looking at the whole ecosystem? Foresters are custodian of the ecosystem, not of a few species. We also did, yeah, in, in our research and understanding, to know that the local person is not malicious about the environment. They are doing this for survival. At Africa Robert Bank, what we've done is we put infrastructure, we put uh, seed and research and others to make sure that the farmers reach the markets and also increase their productivity. If that is done, we can lessen the impact on the forest. I think I can say more about this, but I think uh, for time's sake, we need C4 to look at the trend analysis of this forest, past, present, we talked about satellite. In the next 10 years, I had a good experiment in Australia where they're looking at how much carbon dioxide will affect the forest over the next generations. So, uh, moderator, we have challenges, but we have opportunities. The economies in Africa are growing very fast. We need them to grow much, much more faster. So the reliance on natural resources, especially force, is reduced, and we don't kill our own livelihoods. That is the forest. Let me ask you one follow-up question. Um, each of our speakers that, that preceded you made some mention about the role of smallholders um, in uh, productive activities, whether it was the, the woodlots of various kinds and their uh, success or failure, the, the impact of biofuel development on, on smallholders, um, the shift, you know, in drivers of deforestation to more commercial scale, you know, larger uh, drivers. I understand that some of the bank's work in Zambia has been in particular to work with farmer cooperatives in outgrower schemes and, and those kinds of, of programs. And in the context of, you know, what's already been said, what are you learning or, or what, what good news or, or what challenges would you put before us about how to improve rural incomes related to, maybe perhaps related to forests, um, while at the same time maintaining forests for the many other roles that, that we've been talking about? Thank you very much. Uh, my own parents were small-scale farmers. They grew coffee and they kept livestock. But this coffee we grew because we had a cooperative which was working. We had rural roads which were working. We had agronomists who were bringing in siblings. We had uh, experts which are providing financing. And at the end of every other season, there was a check and went to school. These days, if you don't partner with those who can get you to market, those who can provide you infrastructure, those who can provide you water. You just have small dotted experiences here and there. What you require is scaling out those experiences to larger areas of policy and also to larger numbers of farmers so that we can make a difference even in one way. I did my own research. You can go to my website there. We found that the small-scale farmers need organic matter. They need nutrients in their soils. They need markets to move. And this movement is now called conservation agriculture. It's even now put in our comprehensive agriculture development program. There are many land grabbers in Africa, but those are not doing it because we are not inviting them. There's a lot of land issues in Madagascar, Tanzania, Uganda, near Sea Congo, for big issues that uh, my colleagues talked about. But the small scale farm, the small old farm, needs income. Income, health, and education for their children. If these are provided through increased productivity, I think our forests will be safe. 
Therefore, in Zambia, we now have a model called uh, farm blocks, where we're putting infrastructure for small scale farmers, medium scale and large farmers, so that they can go ahead and develop agriculture of the future. And one forest in Mount Calm in Uganda, we now have, because the establishment of forests is very expensive, what we've done is give away this land to the private sector, including people like you and me, so they can now grow carbon crops. Uh, but what we require from C4 and others is how do you now model so that at every stage of growth, these forests and their carbon is now being evaluated and given monetary terms. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks to our discipline panel who kept their answer short, we do have more than half an hour for uh, questions and comments from the audience. Um, what I'd like to do is um, take, you know, baskets of comments together and, and then have the, the panel respond as appropriate. Um, we have two mics to be roving in the audience, uh, one over here, uh, yeah, the two of them over here. And um, what I ask is that you identify yourself and, and please keep it short. And if you're directing your comment to one of the panelists in particular, um, let us know that too, please. Um, yes, my name is Duncan McQueen from the International Institute for the Environment and Development. Um, I was very struck yesterday um, at an FAO meeting on forests um, where a large number of timber companies were represented. Just how upbeat they were um, and uh, the green economy forest is the heart of a new green economy, part of which is energy. And then the second observation is that in Europe, um, biomass energy for electricity is, is happening at pace, and there's a huge, hundreds of billions of up and dry tons predicted increase in supply, and it needs to be met from somewhere. So I can see the potential for well-organized industrial sort of supply of those sorts of energy. And I guess my question to Mariki particularly is, how do we include the smallholders and allow them to profit from this potential economic opportunity? And it was, as uh, Francis, you were saying, asked the question about organization. Are there solid uh, community forest associations or smallholder forest associations with a commercial orientation and what's being done to establish them if there aren't? And then a question across to Freddie with the African Development Bank. Is the African Development Bank contemplating funding the new forestry and farm facility that was specifically designed to support the organization of small farmers? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Gus. Uh, I'm from Ethiopia. I would like to ask a specific question for the person who speaks about the food security impact of forests. Like one of the, I think the African Development Bank representative mentioned that forests are source of health because many people depend for medicinal plants and same source. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Depend on forests, but there are also some cases where forests could be a source of uh, bad heads, like from my experience. There are some people, forests can host some parasites that would affect levels of the pool, like malaria. From my experience from Ethiopia, many people who are victims of malaria lives around the forest. So, how is in this reverse causality? Of course, we know that forests give, you know, medicinal plants, there are forests are source of health, but forests could be also source of malaria. Malaria is the number one killer in Africa, even more than that of HIV. So how we see this, like, it could be from C4, it could be from other research institutions that deal with this, do you see this factor? And the second is, I think the chairperson mentions that 20% of income for poor farmers, like for some many, I don't know the number, forests provide 24% of income. But this 20% income or this high dependency on forests mean high income. I mean, people maybe 
dependent on forests because they don't have an option. But the return from forests could be low. And some forest products could be domesticated. And some forests could be uh, identified given with complementary assets. So does this dependency mean higher income? <coughs> I did a research related on that and related on, uh, I found that that dependency may not be People depend on forests because they have no choice. So, have you seen this aspect of your research? Again, in terms of food security and other issues, like most research deal with the issue of like income from forests and so on. But there are many food security indicators, like it could be health, it's kind of food security, uh, it could be distress of assets, it could be the number of methods that we have in our food. So, are we aggressively measure the impact of forests? We are only focused by providing 20% of income, 50% of income of purpose comes from forests. But we have to see in terms of, because most product, forest products would also provide seasonal benefits. So, did any research try to capture this? Because poverty is multidimensional. So we don't have to stick only on income aspects. So we have to see everything in terms of diverse things. So that's what I'm sure. Um, I see Carl Hausman is sitting next to you. Um, Carl, do you want to make a quick comment at this point? Carl is um, the vice chair of the CGIR consortium board and um, is a self-confessed person who doesn't know that much about forests compared to the abundance uh, that he knows about, about other parts of agriculture. And Carl was one of the ones at this Agriculture and Rural Development Day yesterday. And I'm, I'm curious, Carl, whether you think that this new approach of the sort of landscape level integrative approach, trying to marry the agriculture and, and forestry communities. How, how's it going? What, what's the report from the front? Well, to some extent, you are the ones living at the front, not me. But what I'd like to add to it is yesterday at our meeting, which was entitled Agricultural and Rural Development Days, focused probably more than on agricultural and rural development, but on the complementarity of forests with the, uh, forests in the total landscape for the development of agriculture. I found it interesting because typically I think we've seen that they are, one tends to be enemy of the other. You see all oh, agriculture moving into it, stealing forests, or we need to protect this. Uh, the more we can see this as complementary, the better off we have we all are. Our challenge is how do you do that? It, it, it's, I, I think in theory, I mean, 50,000 feet, they can be complementary, but I'd like to pick up something that Freddie said, which I thought was very important. In order to make these two complementary, we have to make sure that we have regional policies and regional support for infrastructure, that you have some governance about how you blend these two complementarities together. Like in any marriage of complementarity, Forces, you can get out of balance. It takes smart infrastructure, smart policies, support to co ops to bring that balance back together. And yesterday, in the agricultural day, we talked more about finding this smart balance than we did about forcing more production agriculture. And I think that it was an interesting development from yesterday's session. Okay, thanks. More hands? Yes, one more down here. Myself, Mahavi Sharma. I am from Indian Forest Service and serving the forest uh, government of India since last 25 years. Uh, and it's just by chance that I am associated with the social forestry, agroforestry, farm forestry, and community forestry, community forestry since 84. And, uh, presently, I have just graduated from Yale University, USA, in uh, environment management. So I would uh, like to add to the discussion that my state is one of the richest state, Haryana state, and it is predominantly the agricultural state. Uh, we were having just 3.8% of the total forest cover, and rest of the, most of the area was under agriculture. And land is quite prime, and we are also having very good developing industrial and urban sectors, just imposing upon the agricultural land and also upon the forest land. But 
while and we were also having some of the areas very poor very poor in which we were have we were having this fuel wood problems and forests were degrading also so initially when i joined we were giving given targets fuel wood plantations timber fodder like that and we were managing these plantations in one tuber crop on the ground so <clears throat> with that the even the fertile lands which were producing 110 of the wheat per hectare the farmers which were producing so much amount of wheat per hectare also shifted to the this agro forestry and presently we are having 8% of the total tree cover in our state and in my one of the cities where i was posted uh, before coming here it is having one of the biggest timber market of the asia meaning thereby there is lot of timber industry and lot of wood is required still we are feeding the those industries and our forest cover is increasing our community forest project has been evaluated by european union and we have been uh, evaluated as best as one of the best community forest and we got the national prize at bone also so what i mean to say when we plan plan the forestry projects with a holistic approach keeping in view uh, keeping in mind the requirements of the local population and also the available resources so if we take take uh, this uh, manage land water livestock and the needs of the population in a holistic approach then we are able to sustain our forestry uh, agenda uh, i was very much interested in knowing about the concerns of brazil where i have seen from the air also that complete clear felling is going on that area is being put down agriculture so if some good agro forestry models which are very cost effective can could be introduced we can save the forest cover now we have we were just planting the seedlings and we were earning hardly 12 to 15 cubic meters of the biomass from an acre we introduced clonal plantations now we are uh, taking 28 cubic meters of biomass per acre and farmers are coming very promising farmers are coming to us and they are asking for those clonal plants what i mean to say if we link our forestry project to the local economy and if people are sure that certainly it's a better proposal certainly they are going to accept our ideas thank you well, Congratulations on the Community Forestry uh, Award that you received, and I think what you described about the sort of multiple-use forestry is very similar to what we had heard from Bariki before the experience from Tanzania. So interesting uh, cross-continental experience. Let me turn back to the panel and give Bariki and Freddie an opportunity to respond to the first question from Duncan about this opportunity, perhaps, of um, commercial-scale production for for wood fuel. Um, Do you want to start, Rick? Yeah, thank you very much. You see, all of us, everybody, we want development. We only need forest. We need forest which will contribute to sustainable development of the people. Not only through talking, but we can show on the field that people have got forest. So, my brother said, yeah, we have got these policy problems. In Tanzania, must. Multinational companies are grabbing a lot of land for production of biofuel, and they are trophies. So far, their trophies not well tested in the world. They don't have any data available. So far, these people are given a lot of forest. In this, they 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 take away the villages. This land used to be social energy for the villages, but once they give it to multinational multinational company, the villages are driven away of that one, and this is intensifying. The problem, but I think we are now sharing information with other people that please, whatever action we do, we have to show results in the field, and that this results should contribute to sustainable development of the people, not only slow talking. So we are taking that care of that one. And another opportunity, you see, we want people to have more energy. And the biomass fuel or wood fuel is the most versatile 
source of energy in the world. You can produce the liquid fuel, you can produce electricity, you can produce gas, you can use solid. So what we are trying to use that one, you see, what we need is to use the modern technology available to see how can we provide most adequate services to the people based on the available knowledge and the resources they have, as my brother, one of my brothers said, that it is still amazing. We want to see how can we use what we have to the best to achieve what is required. In terms of when we are going to plant trees in the community forestry, one of the key factors that you talk with the community and see what are their problems. If they are poor, what are the underlying causes of, of their poverty? And how can forestry contribute in assuring that one? So, for example, in one region in, in Tanzania, the farmers are getting almost 80% of their income from forest. They are planting industrial plantation. You have assisted them to form through the public private partnership relationship. You have now enabled them to grow trees. You have looked the market for them. And they, they are growing the trees. They sell timber. But the leftover is what is used for firewood. And whatever is left is in plants and so forth. It is given to big companies to produce electricity. And these farmers are growing more trees for their survival rather than agricultural crops. So here there is a lot of opportunities and I think the whole issue of having your holistic support. We have to talk with the farmers. We have to find the realities. We find in one places the farmers are getting very poor crop. Through forestry we are planting nitrogen fixing species which can enrich the soil, can provide firewood, can provide fodder, and increase the agriculture, increase uh, animal production, contribute to environmental protection, contribute to water conservation. At the end, these farmers are happy. And they, when they see you as a forester, they think you have contributed. Them. But it's not only a matter of forestry, you have to connect with the others. I want to produce food, I want to talk with the agriculture people, we have to go to the green sector, we go to agriculture, livestock, we have to go to veterinary, we have to go to land and the other sectors where we work together as a team. So the need of working together as a team is very important, not only one particular aspect. Thank you. Okay, Frank. Thank you very much. Yeah, the African Environment Bank is becoming more and more interested in what really matters at the farm level. We are all being measured, not on the impact on the economic growth, but on the impact of what we do that affects the farming community at the lowest level. We see that rural poverty is one of the biggest challenges. Rural poverty is inextricably linked with policies that we find, uh, some areas we find that are not really well analyzed. The partnership, the partnership, the partnership we have with C4 and the CG is to make sure that quality at entry. What do I mean by quality at entry? We analyze in the communities what the priorities are. The African Women Bank has got a, a department, agroforest, I mean agriculture, agro-industries, and natural resources, whose main job is to make sure the funding that goes into every other sector also gets to the uh, farmer organizations, as we're asking. The answer is yes. Number two, uh, from my colleague from Ethiopia, are we bringing forests to bring more malaria and other parasites and other diseases? I'll tell a small story from Tanzania. When all forests in northern part of Tanzania were cleared because they feared were they were their birds, you know the birds which eat millet and so on, whole forests were decimated. And at the end of it, the birds were still there. So when you clear the ecosystem where some of these farmers live, they come to your house. There is the there are all these work for malaria going on, but I come from a higher and higher you. When we had forests, there were less diseases. When we create the forests, we are suffering. Therefore, please invest in the natural capital. That natural capital is the one which is going to buffer you against those ills that you and I will fear. When you and I were growing up, the forest provided all of us, anything we needed. When we create them, I don't think they're still the same as we used to be. The last point I want to make 
uh, is about to uh, the agroforestry uh, colleague from India. Thank you very much for the about agroforestry. Uh, I think if you recall, probably I'm one of the few people who started the rural studies of agroforestry, prove experimental agroforestry works, and now when I see it at the highest level in the CADAP Conference of Agriculture Development for Africa, it's number two to be invested in. It works, and I think in the African uh, context, we are even looking beyond the few species. We are now trying to look at indigenous species, how they come in, but we have challenges. For example, how much hectares do you require to produce so much honey to a particular quality so that you can export it? How much land do you require to produce mushrooms that are important for the local economy? These are areas which are unsettled, and also we have introduced new things like chemicals into the agricultural land system and forest systems. These need to be addressed in our research so that the agroforestry part, and I think I thank uh, C4 and ICRF and others who are now taking on this whole uh, CPR of trees, forest, and agroforestry to make sure that we rise to a higher level of productivity like we talk about in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me just abuse the chair a moment and respond to the colleague from Ethiopia on um, two things. On the issue of forests and human health, um, C4 published a book about four or five years ago edited by Carol Colfer on a whole series of issues of forest health. And my recollection is that there's specifically a chapter on forests and malaria with research from the Mekong region that was suggestive of actually the opposite of what you suggested, that it was actually forest disturbance that led to increase in incidence of malaria. So you might want to check that out. Um, on your question about the Poverty and Environment Network data and you know how to interpret the 24% uh, figure, you're exactly right. You know that, that's just a, a, the first uh, gleaning of the data. And what uh, C4 scientists and colleagues around the world are doing now is mining this data set to understand the dynamics. For example, by income quintile, is it the richer people who are getting more from the forest or less, or deforesting more? By gender, you know, uh, just splicing the data in all kinds of different ways. So watch this space. I believe there may be even a special issue of world development coming out sometime later this year that'll answer a lot of the questions that you raised about, you know, how to how to contextualize the specific factoid that I, that I threw out earlier. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions before going back to the panel for, oh, the panel wants to, to respond, yes. I thought you want to learn the lesson from Brazil, um, so yes. I'll to answer that question. Um, the compañero uh, that said something about the agroforestry, yes, um, the biotech section um, the Brazil sector is learning a lot. Uh, including the fact that we have a you know, research here and it's also part of the research and when we've done a lot of food work, is also does work with agroforestry. And he's been working in this project in the Amazon region in Pará. Especially, we are learning from the fact that the other sector is the cosmetic sector is investing in more sustainable green um, forests. Uh, in the case of oil palm, produce in a more like sustainable way because their products should be sustainable. So they are selling this products for women to become beautiful, beautifying them with all women we love to use beautiful creams to become younger, but we want to know where it comes from. So the consumer's pressure over the products you buy for oil palm especially because in every food we eat there's oil palm. In every uh, cosmetic we use there's oil palm in the base. So this is special, I'm not going to make it uh, here and the special name for it because of course we're not selling the products here. But they're they're pushing for more agroforestry based production of oil palm. And the research done in the past five years has shown exactly that that the increase in the plantation started like five years ago and now started to give the first production of oil palm and it increased the amount of oil and the palm the nuts being produced. And as well as timber and other products, and cash crop products, they use for the smallholders. It's all for smallholders, and they very much happy with the income they're getting from the other products they have in their other forestry. Not only for you know, in the five year they have to wait until the oil palms be produced. If you're in the normal contract, you have to just wait. And in that case, with agroforestry, create not only income but also more biodiversity. 
They also test it out with other plants where there's no agroforestry taking place. There's uh, better improvement in the soil, you know, more uh, biodiversity indexes, and as well as increasing the amount of the product, you know, the oil that's being produced. So there's a lot of hope and opportunities, you know, thinking and opportunities for the biodiesel sector in the region because they want to learn the technology. They're already looking for uh, in this company, in this cosmetic company, and finding ways how to do that with the small holders in the region. So this is for entire Pará state. It's a huge state in the Amazon. And so Petrobras is looking for this technology in Rio Valley. And this valley is the largest mining company. So if that is for biofuels production, or biodiesel in, in the Amazon, there's hope that we can keep the forest and improve life sec uh, food security as well for the small holders. Ruth. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just circle back for a second to the wood fuels uh, issue. We've been, uh, I think we can all agree in this room on the need to think holistically about landscapes and about livelihoods and just to throw into the discussion the public health issue that's involved with um, wood fuels in terms of the uh, respiratory illness, particularly to women and children who are exposed to um, lots of indoor air pollution from the use of uh, of wood fuel. So I think our goal is um, not only to improve forests through uh, wood fuel production, but improve health through reducing the exposure to, um, to air pollution from the use of wood fuel. Yeah, great. So next time we do a session like this, we're going to have a forest and health session too. So there's a lot of energy for that. Okay, a couple of hands. Let me ask everybody to keep it short because we're, we're getting close to the end of time, but I want to capture as many as we can, and then we'll go back to a, a last round of answers from the panel. Um, maybe uh, Ruth could, uh, could address on the big picture of the future. The next 50 years, a uh, big increase in population, um, so the question is, um, is the intensification that you mentioned that has been happening in Brazil, is really possible um, to think that it's still happening that way, or otherwise, where uh, is the food going to come uh, from, obviously, the issue of perhaps uh, GM food or non GM food or other uh, type of agricultural intensification. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, I see one in the far back. to all the friends from the globe here. Uh, my name is Saurabh and I'm from India. Uh, when you talk about forest, well, one important thing is before forest we have to think about the tribals. I think many of you agree with me at this point. The tribals, we sitting in the air conditioned chambers with the suits over us and from degrees from some universities, we think that we know forest, we know nature more than that. But sorry my friends, I worked for three years in the tribal areas of India and I think the knowledge they have regarding the forest, regarding the biofuels, regarding everything about the nature is more far than we can get in any university. But this is not the point I'm talking about. First is that in India I found the land rights, the right to cultivate the right on the land, the right on the water, is not now with the people. Capitalization, industrialization, and the government has taken those rights away from them. Now they can't cultivate much. Many of the farmers doesn't have the plot of lands. They want to have their earning, but they can't. Deforestation, I told you about Dhaka from India, maybe one of my friends sitting in India, he may know. 44 lakh hectare of land in India is just useless. It doesn't have the, no, it's, it's just of the government and it is just lying down. We, as a part of an NGO which is called as Ekta Parishad, we are fighting for that line, rights of land to the tribals, for the indigenous. We are asking the government to give them the land so that they can cultivate, they can grow forests, they can do things. 
that can give them the living, that can give them the bread and butter, which had been taken away from the government far years before. Second thing, when you talk about power and energy, it's okay the biofuel everybody is talking about, but in India, you didn't expect I will tell you, there is a plant called Tetropa. I hope many of you know about it. It's okay. It's a biofuel. But when it's come to the farmers, sometimes the government forces them to grow that. And the second demerit is that when they grow, the land becomes fertile. The land is useless. Now they can't grow anything else. So here many intelligent people are sitting. What the world came from between a holistic approach, a balance is required. And at the conclusion of this forum, we have to think that how we can create that balance with the help of the people who are sitting in the forest and doing this. Okay, thank you. I think we have one more. It's not only people in the aisles who are allowed to make comments, so if there's anybody else who wants to raise their hand, please, but in the meantime, here we go. Well, it's just a brief comment about the question. Uh, Eduardo Jr. from the Board of Mexico, and I want to add up uh, Carl's comment. So he was talking about uh, the, the, the infrastructure that needs to be built to work in a landscape approach and uh, the policies that need to be made. And uh, I, I think Francis asked about this specific Thing. So how does the market has to work for landscapes to work? We, because we've heard a lot about RSPO, we've heard a lot about sustainable soil, but how is this really making it to, to, to the ground and what needs to change on the market's perspective? <coughs> so that's okay, last call. Okay. So we're down to five minutes. So what I propose to do is to let uh, each panelist have sort of a one, one minute turn at the mic. And you can choose to respond to this last question or, or others. But the challenge I'd like to put to you, if you could put one research question to C4 or to other organizations represented here that you know it would be the single most important question to answer, and maybe it's the question that was just put forward, um, where should we focus our research effort to really you know, optimize the forest and uh, question, forest and food, forest and energy, forest and income? What would be that research question if you could only fund one? Where would you put your money? Mariki. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, difficult question. But at the end of the day, to see, to see is to believe. What the research which can show the amount of knowledge which has been generated, how is it being used to improve our poverty, particularly in Africa? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there is a lot of research, as we said here, about health, and forest, health and water, health and income, and so forth. A lot of information. So I was thinking that maybe we really need to capitalize not to reinvent the wheel, but to see how can we utilize the available data and the, how do we share. And not only to utilize by terms of putting the publication, but to send it to the people who matter and to show that really the research and contributed to improvement of people's livelihood in a particular area has been mentioned in many places, like my brother there, there. Now the farmers are getting more money and getting more. Not only through talking, but it means through research. So the need of integrating research training and the extension need to be intensified. Otherwise, we shall continue to conduct research and research, but the people are getting poorer and poorer. And that's the other So I think that it's an area where we need to share our efforts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I agree that the knowledge that we have and the more we know, less we know, we know about things. And, and the people who live in the forest, they know more about the forest. And that's, that's uh, I agree completely. So um, the research question that would be, and also thinking about landscapes and the governance issue, you know, is that we have enough policy in Brazil now. We have enough policy that we can all learn from. Um, but still on the ground, there's a lot to do. And how can we, as scientists and also policymakers, really help the local government to go and do the right thing for the smallholder to be able to survive and as well get into the biofuel section if they have to, because sometimes they have no other choice 
but it still keeps the forest as a, not only as a service, but as, as a means of survival for their cultural survival as well as for their um, you know, economic survival. And for that, and there's a lot of research that needs to be done. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of will from the local government because there's a lot of power in place when you think of the local government. Especially in democracies like in Brazil where there's a lot more for decentralization, municipalities have more, um, let's say, leeway to work on, and this elite still caught a lot of the industries and they get more of the benefits. And the benefits when it comes to the industries like the biofuels, it's not shared. When there's charcoal, it's not shared in the same way. So large companies are taking over the lands, grabbing, grabbing, you know, grabbing more lands, and concentration happening, displacing the local forest, the traditional communities, and we have to stop that. So I think the research is how can we bring their voices home and bring the mechanisms to the ground that it can work. We'll take that point to the policy panel this afternoon about needing to work with local governments. Ruth. Yes. Um, on the comment on the indigenous knowledge and tribal knowledge, um, I have to um, add my agreement 100% with that, uh, with that comment. Uh, we're here to do the best we can with the knowledge that, <coughs> that we have to offer. Uh, on the intensification question, maybe we can talk about that at the break because um, most of the food production, increase in food production over the last, enormous increase in food production over the last uh, five or six decades or so has come from intensification and not from expansion and that will very much likely to continue. So the, the, the opportunity is to um, configure our decisions for intensification of land while without putting more pressure on, on parts. So maybe we can talk about that more. On the research, I think, um, really need to work towards a science base for the uh, decisions that allow uh, policymakers to analyze what the trade-offs are in different decisions about land use. And that does not necessarily mean always preserving uh, forests. What are the trade-offs that are being made for food production, for watershed protection, for carbon, et cetera, all of the roles of forest trade-offs and synergies both to be able to provide that science base uh, for decision makers and also to provide the, to develop the understanding of what government uh, structures work to be able to use that kind of scientific information and to orient the, the, uh, the science and the information to particular places because different places are very, very different. So uh, what are the trade-offs and synergies and governance structures that work in different cultural settings and different ecological uh, settings? And if you had to pick one scale, what would be the scale for this research? Oh my, watershed scale, how about that? Okay, <laughs> thanks. Ready. Mine is to include everybody in this room. Uh, and I'd like to quote from uh, the work we did with the Art Institute at Columbia and MacArthur Foundation, where we're dropping the Masters in Roman Practice. It says that in the weapon challenges, of sustainable development from extreme poverty and disease control, climate change and ecosystem vulnerability can only be resolved by leveraging uh, knowledge and skills from a range of disciplines. Meaningful progress requires practical well managed policies and programs that incorporate insights from health sciences, natural sciences, and social sciences. That's the message I want to give you. And if we were to ask C4 for the next big thing, I would like to see the dry forest of Africa have a network like we did for the, uh, for the Congo Basin Forest so that we can mobilize and mobilize uh, resources to take the challenge on one of the most deforested zones in this continent. Thank you very much. Well, we're ahead of you, Freddie, because we just opened an office in Nairobi to uh, get back into the game in the dry forest in sub Saharan Africa. Sure. Yeah, well, we talk a lot about Amazon when you think of Brazil, but the second largest biome ecotone is the Cerrado, the Savanna. And we haven't been able to see any efforts yet from C4 in that area. So, Atinga and Cerrado. 
So that would be, well, I'm not the, the bank here, not right <laughs> I don't have the money to invest on that, but we would love to have, you know, your office in Brasilia, so then you can, from their point of view, you know, see the Cerrado better than only just being the lane. Um, so we invite you to come and visit the Cerrado more often and work on that. Okay, great. Well, we are now out of time. Um, I have been given a message that the Norwegian Minister of the Environment has arrived, and so we'll be here to make the, the address after the coffee break. So let me invite all of you to leave this room by the back doors. Coffee will be available um, in this, this area, and then we'll assemble in the room next door in 30 minutes' time for the address from the Norwegian Minister of Environment. So now um, join me in a round of applause for our very capable panelists.